I used to uh, take students into this particular region, and so there are rocks all over the place that contain fossils of other parts of those trees that we saw right. before. This rock right here is, uh, has got some fossils of the roots of those trees. You have the uh, root structure here uh -huh. coming off of it, rootlets. There's a second root here with rootlets coming off of that. Oh, rootlets coughing off in that direction. Yeah. So we've got roots. We've already seen bark. Um, if you search around, you'll find all sorts of other kinds of parts of plants. Here, for example, we've got fossil leaves. They're not the same kind of plant as these. Uh, this is a, a different type of plant from that same forest. But in the process of, huh. as you can see, the, the shiny yeah. stuff is actually the, the actual leaf material. Oh my goodness, yeah. Preserved. And you got the leaves going in all sorts of different directions. So it's a different type of leaf, but you, you're getting pictures, if you wish, of not just the lycopods that made the floating mat, mm -hmm. but all sorts of other kinds of plants. Yeah. When you put all this together, all sorts of plants of different types, you begin to get a picture of the ecosystem that these things were yeah. formed in. So this is a picture of that uh, antediluvian world. Right. And, and uh, either the lushness or whatever that is, these are plants from that time. Yes, so, yes. What else do we know about that world from a plant perspective? Well, they, there'd be some plants that were, uh, I, I love these fossils, they, they look very much like fern fossils uh, or fern leaves. Mm -hmm. And they'd be laid out like you had put these plants into a book mm -hmm. and it flattened them Pressing. out really, really flattened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And these fossils, they're not bent, they're not broken, they're not even folded over on themselves, they're just as flat as could be. How does that happen? Well, that's, that's an interesting question yeah. because like this is a plant, a fern here. How do we get the fern to be perfectly flat on a surface? It doesn't grow that way even. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what do you do? Do you dump mud on top of it and smash it down? You're gonna get things folded. Right. You're gonna th get things broken. Mm -hmm. But if you look at these fossils, they're not that way. They're all spread out just as flat as could be and with great intricacy. Okay, so How this is a mystery. How in the world does this happen? <laughs> it's a mystery. And, and I didn't understand it for a while until actually I was in college and learned about learned a little bit about plants and something called turgor pressure. We've all had plants in the house that have we haven't watered in a while and we right. should have and the little plant goes Eep. right and, and then you put water in the thing and it straightens back up mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. It gets stiff. The reason for that is because plants are built differently than animals in a variety of ways. One is around each cell which doesn't exist in an animal, is a cell wall. It's kind of a hard cubicle that the cell is in. And if the cell pulls in a bunch of water and swells up and pushes against the side of that cubicle, it stiffens the whole okay. plant. If the cell uh, shrinks because it's lost water, it pulls away from those cell walls, and then the it cell dirts. walls get yeah. weak uh -huh. and it turns over. That right. turgor pressure is where the water comes in and stiffens the whole plant mm -hmm. so it can straighten up. Turns out that you could, for example, take one of these leaves and break it off and toss it into water and it won't do it immediately, but in time these leaves will flatten out and then if it happens to get waterlogged and fall down to the bottom, it's going to be this very flat structure. Now, what happens if a dead leaf, it's already dead, falls off the tree and goes into the water. That never flattens out. Why is that? Because the cells have already died, oh. the cells have burst, and turgor so, pressure doesn't work. So okay? that water does not uh, move inside the cell. So you can't take dead leaves and create these beautiful flat leaves. So that they means had to be alive. that these leaves have got to be alive uh -huh. at the time they're ripped off of their origin. They've got to be floated for a certain amount of time, for at least hours, in water, and then deposited in water to end up so flat as this. So yeah. we've got, we're now starting to get a picture mm -hmm. of the process necessary to get this, the leaves to this, to this state. We're destroying an ecosystem by water, biblical flood, carrying those 
those plants over a great distance mm -hmm. and depositing them into this kind of an environment like this. Then what kind of plants do we find? Uh, we find a strange set of plants. We were looking at this, uh, uh, these roots here. Mm -hmm. and These roots are hollow roots with hollow rootlets and hollow stems. These are trees that are only made of bark. Yeah. Very strange, Very strange trees. trees. Yes. The trees are designed, it seems, to actually float in water. This led mm -hmm. Joachim Shevin in the early 80s to suggest that the coal plants were actually part of a floating forest that existed on a large body of water before the flood and that they were destroyed mm -hmm. in the flood. Now, I didn't know anything about his, his particular theory. I was kind of interested in another issue, which is not just the, the fossil, not just the trees, but all the fossil plants. Because in the fossil record, it turns out that uh, when I went through school, learning about paleontology, about fossils, I was told by evolutionists, the order of the fossils in the record corresponds to evolution. Right. Okay. And uh, so one of the first things I did when I had the opportunity was test that hypothesis. What is the order predicted by evolution? And what is the order that you actually find mm -hmm. in the fossil record? Specifically of when the, the order that the kingdoms come in, the order that the phyla come in, the order that the classes come in, the order that the, order, that the orders come in. And I found that for shallow marine invertebrates, which is 95% of the fossil record, the record doesn't correspond. It, major groups of organisms don't appear in the fossil record in the order evolution predicts. 95% huh. of the time, there's no correlation. So in science, usually when we say we've explained 95%, no need to go any further, we've explained enough. But for, for a while, I was wondering about that other 5%. Yeah. What, what about the ones that actually do, and what actually is in the right order? Mm -hmm. The things that turn out to be in the right order, the best example, if I was an evolutionist, I'd jump on the plants. The major groups of plants 12 of the 13 are in exactly the order evolution predicts. Order in the fossil in record. In the fossil record. They come into the fossil record as groups of plants in the order evolution would say they should come if okay. they ar arose by evolution. Uh -huh. So I became intrigued with that. What could explain this in terms of a flood? I be, I'm not believing in evolution. How do I get that order? Mm -hmm. And I... I remembered as a, as a kid having an experience uh, on a quaking bog, which is a mat of vegetation that grows over water. Uh, is, 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 <laughs> okay. And it, I was 12 years old at the time, it's really cool. We got out of the car, we walked through the forest, and man, we were walking up the steep paths and down, and all up and down, up and down, and all of a sudden, the path got really flat. Um, it was a sudden transition from, mm -hmm. but still the same woods, same trees, all that sort of thing, but very, very flat. Mm -hmm. We walked down about 100 feet into this flat stuff. The guy that was with us said, okay, now everyone grab hands. So there were 12 or 13 of us there. We all grabbed hands. Like, what in the world is this guy doing? Mm -hmm. And he says, okay, now we, we got to get this all in sync. Everybody's got to jump up and down at the same time. <laughs> like, what is he doing? Yeah. So it took a, quite a while to get... 13 people to jump up at the same time and land at the same time. So like big jump rope, I guess. But when we got into sync, I realized I hit the ground and the ground moved. The ground went down. And when I went up, I pushed off. The ground continued to go down. When I went up, I came back down. The ground was on its way up and I met it. And I realized oh, we're the pushing the ground up and down. It's bouncing. We're in a circle. So it was creating basically a wave. If you throw something into water and you see those round waves yes. move away from yeah. it, every time we pushed down and then came up, the, that hump we are produced would move out from us like mm. a wave through uh -huh. water, through the ground, okay? Oh. And as it did, these plants, which were standing up straight, what? would, would mm. sway uh. as it moved. And it got to oh. trees and the trees would move. And I realized, as we're continuing to move up and down, we got these concentric circles, we must be on water. All right. This, this must be a forest sitting right on top of water. Andy. It's called a quaking bog. If you look at a quaking bog, it's something that grows away from the shore, grows out into open water, 
in the, there are certain types of plants which go out first, which are little guys, and then there are bigger plants that grow after them, and bigger ones and bigger mm -hmm. ones, and they get thicker and thicker layer of peat there that they're growing on. We continued that walk from there as we went out towards the center of what I didn't know at that time was actually a lake. Uh -huh. It got thinner and thinner, so you didn't need the whole group. You could individually, you could create mm -hmm. these waves. Get a little bit further and you realize each each step was pressing the yeah. ground down. It's like, uh, That'd be weird. I'm, a little, <laughs> I'm a little concerned about right. this. Yeah. And I realized at some point, this is a little too mushy. I'm a bipedal organism. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's you good for me to, to be in this yeah. position. So I got on my hands and knees to spread my weight out. And, and even my elbows are mo I get out further and we've, the trees are gone, and now we're talking about shorter bushes, mm -hmm. tall bush cranberries. Mm -hmm. Then we got into short bush cranberries and, and blueberries and this sort of thing. By now, I am, I am flat. I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to go through, and yeah. you know, I could never find my way back up. Eventually, I got to where I'm not going any further. This is getting thinner. Open water out there. This is something that grows out over water, small plants to large plants. Mm -hmm. And you can actually float entire forest. So I realized yeah. when I look back at the fossil record, what if you had a huge floating forest, not growing out over the land, but actually floating on the ocean? Uh -huh. And that these various strange plants that we have in the fossil record, these hollow trees that are designed to, to be light enough to float, what if they make up the center portion, the old portion of the forest, and then you have smaller plants right. designed to, to grow out at concentric circles away from uh -huh. it. And I realized that if there was such a thing before the flood, the flood waters with the big waves would begin to destroy the forest from mm -hmm. the outside in. It would first uh -huh. destroy the little guys Sorry. and then the bigger ones and the bigger right. ones and finally destroy the yeah. center portion with the big trees. Mm -hmm. And what that would show underneath the forest uh, at the bottom here, is you'd first have the little plants, right. and then the bigger plants, and the bigger plants. And you'd have that order. And so when you look at the fossil record of the plants, those 13 groups of plants, it turns out two things. Their design is such that as you go up the column, they're more and more independent of standing water. The ones, the first ones you get uh, need standing yeah. water to reproduce. They actually have sperm and eggs that swim towards each other. Oh, oh. And as you go up, you get to drier plants. Mm -hmm. You also go from small plants to big, big plants. And the thing that always mystified me about the plants, you find them in marine sediments mixed with marine organisms. Like why in the world are plants, I asked my professors, why in the world are plants found with marine organisms? Well, they must have floated down the, the rivers and the creeks and, and ended uh, up in the ocean. I said, I'm having a hard time yeah. understanding how that works. Maybe they were there right. in the beginning. But if, in fact, yeah. it's a marine system mm -hmm. of a whole, mm -hmm. I'm going to suggest a continent-sized floating forest wow. that That's... existed the size of North America, let's say, mm -hmm. floating on the ocean before the flood, with all these plants that seem so weird to us, they're mostly extinct today. And thinking about it, if the flood destroyed it, there's no way that forest could regrow on the oceans following the flood because they're too uneven. They're too, oh, it's too right. choppy. Yeah. So once it's destroyed, it's destroyed. Uh -huh. So the reason that most of these plants are extinct is because that ecosystem could That's never gone. rebuild itself. Mm -hmm. And that began a series of investigations on my part to say, Hmm, if that ecosystem was unusual before the flood, is it possible there are others? Uh -huh. And, and uh -huh. began to realize that just about everywhere I turned, I'm looking at groups of organisms that are unique. Uh -huh. Oh, and by the way, the fun thing about the floating forest that I didn't realize right away, I didn't think about the animals at first because I was trying to explain the fossil record of the plants. And then I thought, wait a minute, what about the what about the animals? Mm -hmm. And I remembered crawling around on that <laughs> on that okay. uh, mat, mat, thinking, hmm, what kind of organisms would God create that would be specially designed for that mat? I don't think bipedal organisms are best designed. I think we need no. organisms that can spread their weight out, 
that, that sit low to the ground. And in fact, maybe at the edge of this, where it's much too thin for anything to be on top of it. Mm -hmm. What if you had an animal that could, could float, keep buoy its, its, uh, its, its body up by water, mm -hmm. but actually have little legs that it could run around on this? That would be perfectly designed for it. Now, sure. if the flood destroyed the, the forest from the outside in, it's going to, dis it's going to bury right. these, Those these animals, animals in that order. Mm -hmm. So you'd expect fish to be outside where the forest isn't. On the edge of the forest, you're going to have maybe fishapods, fish mm -hmm. that can actually swim, but they've got okay, these funny right. little legs uh -huh. that can run around on this thin mat that nothing else could run around on. And then further in, you'd have a uh, very broad, which you could potentially have very large, but broadly distributed weight of an amphibian, mm -hmm. which what we find is labyrinthodon amphibians, which are really big, but low-lying uh -huh. and, and their weight spread. And so you'd have a sequence of animals that corresponds to the sequence of plants. And all of a sudden, we've explained the fossil record right. of the, yeah. what looks like evolution of fish to uh, fishapods, mm -hmm. to amphibians, mm -hmm. to, uh, right. to pure land animals. Yeah but in fact is explained by this, the destruction of this floating forest. Yes. So we have a, an ecosystem, uh, first of all, looking at plants, and a very strange one for us today, but a big floating continent uh, of forest, but it has all kinds of plants in it. And that then corresponds to an ecosystem of animals, as you're just saying. Well, that, so that would mean that we have these unique communities then that are part of this Andalusian uh, world. Yeah, we have and a dinosaur community, oh, for example. Uh -huh. So there's a special set of animals and plants that make up a biome, uh -huh. an ecosystem made of both plants and animals, okay. a huge biome uh -huh. that's unique, that's different from all the others. But Kurt, this sounds like uh, this antediluvian world here was remarkable. I mean, it had, it was lush, it had all of these biomes. That's a reflection of the creation, even though it's, it's now past the, the period of the fall. Yeah, I, what I see as I've discovered more and more biomes is I'm understanding that this world before the flood was more diverse than the present world. Hmm. It's, uh, we, we have a God who, as the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, who loves variety, and he, he just creates a variety of things. So I, I'm beginning to understand that he's probably created not just one continent before the flood, but multiple continents, each continent having a different biome. And just all sorts of really cool biomes that we just don't have today. One of them is this floating forest, which mm -hmm. is certainly unique. Yeah. But I've, I've speculated on some others, like a, uh, a hot spring biome with bacterial reefs. Uh. Reefs not of corals and that sort of thing, but a bacteria of all things. It's just wild things. So the world seems to be one of great variety. And what happened in this, in this incredible event of the flood is it seems to have picked up entire biomes uh -huh. and carried them great distances mm -hmm. and then buried them together so that you get the plants and the animals that live together buried together. Right. And, and they, so you end up with these sequential layers with different biomes, not different uh, times in earth history, with different you're plants right. and animals, uh -huh. but you're actually looking at different places on the same world. Uh -huh. So go through a traditional natural history museum and you're getting these dioramas of supposedly different times in earth history. Mm -hmm. No, just rethink it. This is a different place on that world right. that yeah. existed before the flood, uh -huh. the world that then was that being overflowed right. with water perished. Yeah. So that when you go into the various rooms of such museums and see these different snapshots of different places in the world. A travelogue of the world that existed at the time right. of Noah, yeah. not a history of the uh -huh. earth. As you just said, that just is so reflective of a God who is so not only creative, but even within his own nature, uh, bears this diversity and yet unity, all bound up in these wonderful biomes. What, what a great picture. So. That's the picture of the pre-flood world. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the picture of the world after the flood? Well, that period that follows the flood, that recovery period, 
You know, we got a little bit of evidence of it here, mm -hmm. but there's a place I show you which has got a, it's a little more obvious. Okay. And we can talk about that period following the flood. All right. So let's, uh, let's take a gander okay. at that. All right, I'm on your six again.